<laughs> Salutations, and welcome to yet another installment of our Halo beta series. But just like the Halo Wars Alpha that I covered previously, we'll be looking at another Alpha build this time. Well, we will be going back to Halo 2 like we did with the multiplayer beta over a year ago. Before I get started with this video, I need to make a couple of apologies. First, I'd like to make a formal apology to all of you. I haven't uploaded in a long time, and this isn't fair to all of you. I've been going through some personal real life issues and I'm trying to get my shit together and upload way more frequently than I do at the moment. I also would like to apologize to Toxin. In the first System Link gameplay video that I uploaded for the Halo 2 beta, I was openly talking down about his crowdfunding project in the comment section when people started questioning about the legality of the Patreon page. I had someone in the comment section on my first Halo 2 Alpha gameplay reel talk some sense into me, and his words helped me to look into the situation in a different light. Most collectors wouldn't even give development builds like this a chance to see the light of day, and I should have been more grateful about his endeavors for getting this build released to the public. So I'd like to apologize for my ignorance. I have no excuses. Lastly, I'd like to apologize to GameCheat13 for the inclusion of the fuck GameCheat gamer tag that was seen in the first video that I did for the alpha build of Halo 2. It didn't cross my mind that it'd be offensive to include those clips, and I had no ill intent to shame his image and I was only trying to cover the material in the scarce amount of clips that I had available to me. Once this video uploads, I'm going to be taking down that first video. Not only will the offensive material be taken down, but that video will become pointless anyway as the content within that video will be covered in this full analysis. With all that said and done, let's begin. This alpha build represents a transitional period from the content seen in Halo Combat Evolved and the E3 2003 campaign demonstration for Halo 2 up until what we will be seeing in both the beta and retail versions of the game. This build was compiled in November of 2003, only a few short months after Bungie had scrapped the stencil engine used in the E3 2003 demo, and went back to using a modified version of the Blam engine used in the first game. Speaking of the first game, expect to hear a lot of references to Halo 1 throughout this video as there are a plethora of characteristics from the first game that are still being used in this build of Halo 2. The test itself took place in January of 2004, two months after the build was compiled. An old Xbox.com article, which can be found using the Wayback Machine, talks about this specific testing phase for Halo 2 and how it went about. Like the Halo 2 multiplayer beta that I covered, the Alpha was also internally tested by Microsoft employees, who were mailed physical discs that contained the build. One notable difference regarding the distribution, however, was the amount of discs provided for this test. The Halo 2 beta had around 7,500 discs manufactured for that test, but this alpha build only had 1,000 copies produced, which made this build exponentially more rare than the beta, hence why it was only rediscovered earlier this year. For a five-week period, the Microsoft employees that were invited into this testing phase played Slayer, Capture the Flag, and Assault on three multiplayer maps over Xbox Live, which were Lockout, burial mounds, and waterworks. If you want to read up on the experiences that some of the employees had during this test, I recommend giving this article a read, which will be linked in the description. The author of the article even prognosticated that waterworks was inspired by Halo 1's Blood Gulch, if only he had known what was to come. This particular build of the game was actually featured in Bungie's Halo 2 vidoc, beyond single player, multiplayer, and live. What we wanted to do was take that whole situation and bring it to Xbox Live. Fast forward to the year 2018, 14 years after the Halo 2 Alpha testing phase had completed. A post was made on Assembler Games by a user named Disassembler, who showed that his friend was in the possession of a copy of the Halo 2 Alpha disc. The friend in question, who goes by the user K1MDD, posted some information about the build, such as the options seen in the main menu. However, he couldn't get past the sign-in screen as the game required the player to enter a unique authorization code that Microsoft gave out to the testers, which the user obviously didn't have. He also announced that he was going to hold an auction for the alpha disc, and Toxin1 managed to acquire the disc for over $1,000. Toxin then sent the copy of the files 
to an anonymous person who not only unlocked the alpha to enable players to bypass the sign-in screen, but he also reverse engineered the build to enable online system link support. After a brief GoFundMe campaign to offset the cost of the purchase, the alpha build of Halo 2 was finally released to the public, and this brings us to the entree of this video. Upon booting up the Halo 2 Alpha and agreeing to the EULA, we get a glimpse of the main menu starting background, which is static in this build compared to later versions of the game. Despite the fact that the authentication code pop-up window still shows up in the cracked executable, players are able to bypass it now by simply pressing the A button. The main menu's layout and background screen are quite similar to the betas, with the main difference being that in the beta and onward, the multiplayer selection is divided into three parts, which are split screen, system link, and Xbox Live whereas the alpha has the extra multiplayer selection that shows each mode of play upon accessing it. The campaign, credits, and game demo selections aren't functional. When opening up the settings menu, one notable addition stands out. There is a selection called Playlists. According to its description, players are going to be able to create their own rotation of game types and maps to be used in custom game sessions, which is something akin to how the dedicated servers for the PC version of Halo 1 and 2 function today. Players can access the playlist menu in the alpha and can mess around with the options. Unfortunately, they're unable to be saved and can't be used for system link gameplay. The player's profile menu is nearly the same as the beta and final versions in terms of initial appearances, but many differences can be found under the hood. The edit profile screen is almost the same as the betas, offering only four options to choose from. Both voice settings and Xbox Live settings are unusable options. The most notable change to the edit profile screen, however, is what's offered in the appearance settings. In the alpha, there are two mysterious features that are inaccessible to this build of the game, with armor colors being the only option available to the player. Those two mysterious features will become the player model selection, which is where the player would be able to choose between a Spartan and Elite, and emblems respectively. For now, only the Spartans are usable, and Elites won't be an option until the beta. The officially supported game types that were meant to be tested in this build of Halo 2 were Slayer, Capture the Flag, and Assault. However, six other game types can be seen. King of the Hill, Oddball, and Juggernaut will make it into the final game, but Race, Headhunter, and Warfare offer a different story. Both Race and Headhunter never made it to the retail version of the game at all, and it's interesting how the emblem used for Headhunter is the exact same as the one seen in Reach. Warfare, however, is an interesting case. Pit humans against elites in an epic battle that will shape the outcome of the Covenant War. You have but one life to give for your homeworld. Other than having a single life, if this description rings any bells, it sounds very similar to Halo Reach's Invasion Mode, where Spartans battle against elites over three different objectives throughout the match. There is even an interview where Max Hoberman, who was the multiplayer lead for Halo 2, briefly talks about the cut Warfare Mode. Halo 2 was originally going to cut the arena-style gameplay that was seen in the first game for a much larger scale multiplayer environment, something akin to Halo 5's Warzone. However, Max argued that local play still needed to be supported for those who didn't have Xbox Live access, so the multiplayer team was split up into two groups, one who would still work on Warfare and other large-scale game types, and a second team worked on a party game, which consisted of the Halo 1-style arena gameplay that we eventually receive in the final game. While the party game team got stuff done in a short amount of time, Warfare received next to no attention whatsoever, and due to time constraints, Warfare was eventually cut from the game. There's another interesting aspect to the Warfare selection. It turns out that when you select Warfare to see its settings, it's actually Territories, which does make it into the retail version of Halo 2. The text strings for Warfare appear to be placeholder in this case. While the alpha allows for making default game type variants, none of the settings that can be changed can actually be saved in-game. The way to go about making custom game type variants is extracting the XML files for the default variants from the Xbox and then opening them in a program such as Notepad, for example. From there, you can change whatever you like as long as it's available. The page for editing game types is close to the final product, but one notable exception can be seen in the listed game type emblems on the top left of the screen. Here, it shows the emblems for Race, Headhunter, and a third unknown game type on the bottom right on the list. This is most likely Warfare's emblem. Other than the text string differences, most of the available settings are what you'd expect from a page like this, but some of the options listed here, such as enabling team-based gameplay, game type limit, and win condition, would eventually be moved to other specific pages in later builds of Halo 2. There are four options listed in the page that are notable though. Damage, speed buffs, and nerfs after a kill or a death are options exclusive to this alpha build of the game. Bonuses and penalties for speed actually appeared before in Halo Combat Evolved, and Bungie were experimenting with the idea of bringing him back into Halo 2, 
but sometime before the Halo 2 beta, they were axed out of the game. In the alpha, instead of separate equipment and vehicle options, they're both combined into one item selection, which makes a return from the first game. They even shared the same preview image of a ghost, rocket launcher, and plasma grenade. Going inside the selection, options for power-ups, weapons, and vehicles can be seen together in one page. The power-up selection is nothing more than an on and off switch for all equipment on the map, which includes the overshield, active camo, and health packs. The options for the weapon set and starting equipment are identical to those from Halo 1. Custom starts will have the player spawn with a specific weapon depending on the map that is being played. On lockout, the player spawns with an SMG, while a plasma rifle is given to the player on burial mounds and waterworks. However, if you go to the previously mentioned XML document and change the starting equipment to generic, then the player starts with a battle rifle on all the available maps instead. The next available options are the vehicles, and there are a couple of notable options to talk about. Both the Shadow and the Mongoose were going to be available for use in Halo 2's multiplayer. They're both interesting cases not just because they're cut content, but also due to the fact that they don't appear in the game's files at all. Meanwhile, the Mongoose exists in the Halo 2 beta's files, but cannot be toggled on or off in-game. The Shadow was the old name for the Spectre, and it's not to be confused with the actual troop transport shadow that appears in the campaign. The last page to talk about in the entirety of the main menu is the pre-game lobby. Structure-wise, it bears some similarities to the later builds of Halo 2, but there's still glaring differences that could be immediately noticed. Starting with the obvious, there is no visual selection for game settings. The way the player makes changes to the session is by pressing A to reveal a small pop-up window that offers a number of options. One notable outlier is the option of naming your lobby, which is a feature exclusive to this alpha build of the game. You can give your lobby whatever name you like, and when your game shows up in another player system link list, the name of the lobby will be displayed there. It's unknown as to why this was cut because it would have been a neat feature to have in my opinion, even if it's a very minor setting in the grand scheme of things. Quick options are disabled in this build. The way a player chooses which game type and map to be played is a bit different. By selecting Choose Game, it presents the game types first, then offers the available maps. In later builds of the game, this will be split up into a map setting and a rule setting. Not to be confused with the Halo 1 Xbox mod, the Halo 2 Alpha really does feel like a Halo 1.5, or an expansion pack made for the first game. The HUD is practically identical to the one used in Combat Evolved. The shield and health bars, the ammunition and grenade counter, the motion tracker, and even the flashlight meter, which doesn't work in the Alpha, are all present in this build of Halo 2. And in split screen, the HUD also looks precisely like its Halo 1 counterpart. The health bar, however, visually represents damage in a different way. Instead of small pieces of the bar disappearing after damage has been dealt, like it does in the first game, the entire bar turns yellow to represent minor health damage, then a blinking red to visualize a Spartan in critical condition. Health packs function the same way as they do in Halo 1, showering the screen in a brief fade from white and recovers the player's health. It's important to note that despite the inclusion of health packs, health regeneration actually works in this build, but it's painstakingly slow, taking around 40 seconds to heal a player from red health back to full. It's also worth mentioning that the default amount of health that a Spartan has is surprisingly low. It's at such a low amount that grenade jumping is impossible. The in-game scoreboard is identical to CE's as well, showing the position, gamer tag, and score of each player. It'll say a quip like, sorry, you're not a winner if you lose, which is pretty humorous. Moving on from the HUD, the player's movement also mirrors combat evolves in regards to how floaty the Spartan feels when running and jumping. The jump height is pretty much the same as CE's. Crouch jumping is also noticeably more difficult to pull off like how it is in CE. It's kind of funny how the Spartan's legs just kind of clip into your face when trying this. Another combat evolved quirk relating to player movement that made its way into the alpha is the action of your Spartan recovering from a big fall by squatting onto the ground, leaving the player immobile for about a second. Hit registration on client side is also very CE-esque. The game requires players to lead their shots quite a bit off host. The distance that the reticle needs to be away from the target is about as comparable to how much lead is needed to register hits on Halo PC. Sure, there's some degree of leading in the final game, but it's not to this degree. Melee in this build is rather interesting. Just like in Halo 1, there is no melee lunge, but there seems to be an early concept of a lunge-like melee system in place. If your Spartan is close enough to an enemy and tries to melee, you will snap directions towards the opponent and land the blow. The amount of ammunition the player picks up from a weapon that they already have is only tied to the amount of spare rounds it has, exactly like in CE. For instance, when walking over a sniper rifle that has 8 spare rounds, you'll only regenerate those 8 bullets and ignore the extra 4 that are included in the magazine. 
In Halo CE, when the player is inside a vehicle with usable weapons such as the chain gun turret for the Warthog and holds down the trigger while exiting the vehicle, the weapons will still fire until the perspective changes back to first person. This happens in the Alpha as well. Other various CE remnants include a running animation when moving at a slow pace when it should be walking, weapon launching, Jeff Steitzer's Halo 1 multiplayer clips, and since emblems are not included in this build, each teammate is marked by the same green triangular waypoint used in CE. The Halo 2 Alpha contains 10 weapons total, with two of them being inaccessible through normal means. The officially supported weapons include the Battle Rifle, SMG, Shotgun, Sniper Rifle, Rocket Launcher, Plasma Pistol, Plasma Rifle, and Needler. All of the weapons shown in this build use HUD elements from their Halo 1 counterparts, so the SMG, for example, uses the Halo 1 Assault Rifle's ammo counter. Most of the weapons in the game also have remnants of the melee combo system that was shown off in the Halo 2 E3 2003 demo, where the battle rifle executes three different melee animations consecutively. Also, dual wielding is not implemented in this build of Halo 2 just yet, so weapons like the SMG, Needler, and the Plasma Rifle perform quite differently because of this. It's important to mention that the weapons featured in this build have much faster kill times than their beta and final counterparts due to the relatively low amount of health that each Spartan has. To kick things off for the weapons, the battle rifle is a single shot weapon with a 12 round magazine and is capable of holding 144 spare rounds. It's able to kill in 5 shots to the head or 6 to the body. It essentially performs like the DMR from the Halo Reach beta, but with a higher rate of fire, accuracy, and damage against health. Bungie intended the battle rifle to be a successor to the M6D pistol seen in the first game, and given the 12 round magazine size, as well as the ammo counter ported from the CE pistol, it appears that the BR was originally going to be way more like its predecessor than its counterparts in the later builds of Halo 2. This rendition of the BR is almost straight out of the E3 2003 demo, with its single shot firing mode and the much beefier sound effects from each individual shot. Comparing the BR's firing sound to the Halo 2 Beta's BR, you can see how much they dialed the volume back when they switched the firing mode to burst. An odd quirk about the battle rifle that extends to most of the other weapons in the game is the visual use of recoil when zoomed as either as a host or a client. If you're the host, the battle rifle's scope will visibly react from the recoil with each trigger pull. However, if you're client side, your weapon will be completely still with each shot. Next is the SMG. In terms of function, it's pretty much the same weapon as to be expected, with a magazine capacity of 60 rounds and shoots at a very high rate of fire. Due to the low amount of health each Spartan has, this weapon is very strong, capable of killing an enemy Spartan with only 18 shots compared to the beta's 22 and the final's 25. The 18 shots to kill is actually not that far off from Halo 1's assault rifle, which is a 16 shot kill. An odd feature about the SMG is that despite the fact that it has a 60 round magazine, it starts off with only 100 spare rounds instead of 120, which is weird because it's not mathematically correct. The weapon is also capable of holding a total of 240 spare rounds of ammunition instead of the 180 seen in later builds. It seems like clients are unable to properly burst fire with the SMG. It may look like the SMG is firing in short bursts, but the ammo counter is dumping more bullets than the visuals are conveying. Compare this to the host, and the SMG behaves like it should when used this way. The shotgun is more akin to its Combat Evolved counterpart in this build. Like the final game, it's able to hold 12 slugs at a time, but the weapon can also carry 60 spare slugs like in CE. Also like in CE, it has more range, a much faster reload speed, and the player is able to hold down the trigger to continuously fire shots. The butt of the weapon and the pellets are actually very forceful against most objects, especially against the Spartan's corpse. The reload animation is also different in this build, and it's slightly glitched when it's in the full reload. The third person animations for firing the shotgun are incomplete as well, and it uses the reload animation from its Combat Evolved counterpart. The sniper rifle is essentially the same weapon in this build as it is in the later builds of the game in terms of function, but most of the differences in this version of the weapon are purely cosmetic. The scope and the reticle used for this rifle are the exact same ones used in Combat Evolved Sniper, but the scope's blue elevation markers in the alpha clip through the boundaries of the sight. The text strings for the target distance and elevation are also present, but the numerical counters for them are disabled. The third person animations for this rifle are once again stripped from the CE version. The firing sound uses a beefier rendition of CE sniper rifle as well.
the rocket launcher behaves identically to combat evolves, having the same rate of fire and no target tracking features. He even shares the same firing sound to the CE counterpart. The melee animation for the weapon is drastically different compared to just about any rendition of the rocket launcher in the series. It's honestly kind of disorienting to try to melee with this thing as it forces the vision to follow the weapon as it sweeps across the screen. The last of the usable human weapons is the machine gun turret. It looks and performs like the one seen in the E3 2003 demo, lacking the slabs of armor that act as a layer of shielding for the user, while also sharing the same rate of fire as the Warthog's chain gun turret. With the increased fire rate compared to the later versions, this weapon's borderline overpowered to use in multiplayer sessions. Moving on to the Covenant weapons, we have the Needler. It behaves just like its Halo 1 counterpart, with a rate of fire that builds up in speed as well as housing a 20 round magazine. It also has the fastest melee animation in the alpha. In third person, the blamite sticking out of the weapon won't retract into the weapon as it's being fired, and the melee animation is ripped from CE's Needler. After trying to get this weapon to work during multiplayer sessions, I can say with full confidence that this is the absolute worst weapon in the alpha, just like how the Needler is the worst weapon in the first game. Its projectiles are very slow, and even if you manage to score a super combined explosion, it doesn't kill a Spartan from full health and requires a couple extra shots to finish it off. The story of the Halo 2 Needler is tragic because it turns into an absolute monster in the beta, only for it to be nerfed once again in the retail build. Next is a plaza pistol, and it's a pretty weird variation in this build. The player is unable to hold down a charge and will immediately shoot the overcharged shot after a second of holding the trigger. Both the plaza pistol and the plasma rifle have infinite ammo for some strange reason, which makes noob comboing with the battle rifle a borderline overpowered strategy. In third person, whenever a plasma weapon such as the plaza pistol overheats, it doesn't play an animation for it, and the overheating effect gets stuck on the Spartan's hand. Lastly, we have the plasma rifle. It behaves similar to its combat evolved counterpart, where it's actually effective at medium range combat, but it lacks a stunning effect that made the CE variant so deadly. Its projectiles travel at great speeds, and its damage output per shot is higher as well. Once dual wielding was implemented into multiplayer, the plasma rifle needed to be nerfed in order to prevent this weapon from being too busted. In third person, it uses the Halo 1 assault rifle animation to an idle, and has the Halo 1 plasma rifle's melee animation as well. There are two extra weapons that don't spawn in the levels by normal means, and have to be modded into the maps in order to be used. The first weapon is the Brute Shot. It has a highly inconsistent damage model. If the grenades make a direct impact, they'll sometimes bounce off the player and it will require 3 or 4 shots to kill with this method. If the grenade happens to explode in front of the Spartan, there are instances where it will kill in one explosion, or it will require a second shot for a kill. Its firing sounds and particle effects are in a work in progress state. It's able to hold a whopping 60 spare grenades in the alpha, compared to the beta's 36 and the final's 12. The projectiles in this version of the brute shot behave slightly different. In the later versions of the game, the grenades have to only bounce once for it to explode, whereas the Alpha's grenades continue traveling in the air after making their first bounce, only to explode upon touching a hard surface once again. By exploiting this quirk, we're able to see what the Brute Shot's projectiles look like, and their modified plasma grenades upon closer inspection. The HUD element for the Brute Shot ammunition is interesting, because it's essentially what it'd look like if the weapon were featured in the first game. In third person, the idle animation is rather awkward, it appears to be using a modified version of the assault rifle's idle and melee animations, with the left arm unnaturally extending out to reach the grip. The bayonet also just so happens to be clicking through the poor Spartan's upper arm, which must feel excruciating. The second hidden weapon is a magnum, and is much more incomplete. Its bullets do no damage, it has static first person animations as well as no reload animation, and it uses Combat Evolve's M60's pistol's pickup icon and ammo counter. In third person, Pressing the melee button will actually play the animation unlike in the first person perspective, but it doesn't do any damage to other players. The animation itself resembles the Halo 1 pistols, and the Alpha Magnum actually uses the Halo 1 pistols reload animation as well. This is the only one of the two unused weapons in the Alpha that can be spawned in the level without having to modify map data. By going into the XML game documents, switching the map's weapon to pistols will spawn the unused Magnum. Now it's time to talk about the vehicles. There are three vehicles that spawn on the map by default, with two extra that are hidden in the map files. First is a standard Warthog. Out of all available vehicles in this build, it's the furthest along in terms of completion. While the handling is a tad floaty like its Halo 1 counterpart, it's still able to perform sharp turns with the E-brake. There's no available horn for the driver, much like in the previous game. 
The driving sounds are a bit incomplete as well, but they still sound like Halo 2's Warthog in a way. When the player is a client in a network game, they won't be able to see an exit animation play when leaving a vehicle. And this can be detrimental for anyone sitting in the Warthog's passenger seat, as they'll typically exit the wrong side of the vehicle and lose valuable time if they're trying to escape from enemy fire. Next is the Ghost. It may appear to function much like its final counterpart, but the physics that are applied to the Ghost are extremely floaty, and if either of the wings hits something while it's moving at a fast pace, it'll start spinning out of control. Another notable feature with the Ghost that is exclusive to this build is an overheating mechanic with its weapons. If the trigger is held for a few seconds, the Ghost's cannons will eventually stop firing and excess plasma will expel out of the circular fuselage. Its firing mode is similar to its Halo 1 and Halo 2 beta counterparts, where each shot fires two plasma bolts simultaneously, and they travel at a pretty fast velocity. The last vehicle that appears on the map by default is the Banshee. In terms of movement speed and handling, it's essentially a Halo 1 Banshee, but with boost slapped onto it. The boost on the Banshee is borderline uncontrollable, as the Banshee is unable to turn itself when using the feature. If you've played Halo Custom Edition maps with boosting Banshees included on them, the Halo 2 Alpha Banshee essentially handles just like them. The Banshee in the Alpha is unable to perform aerial tricks like it can in the later builds of the game, and like its Halo 1 counterpart, it's able to hover backwards when the player pushes back on the left thumbstick. There are two extra vehicles hidden in the map files. First up is the Scorpion. Its movement speed is much faster than in the later builds, but not as fast as it was in Halo 1. This vehicle is also very slippery, having little traction that prevents it from driving in a straight line on hilly surfaces. There are no sound effects present on this vehicle, and while the main cannon is still able to do massive amounts of damage, the secondary machine gun has no damage model whatsoever. The machine gun is also able to continuously fire when the player is not the host of a match. Unlike the Scorpion seen in the later versions of Halo 2, this alpha version has side seats like those seen in the previous game. However, the Spartans don't have an animation for sitting on the treads, so they stand in a T-pose position. Another odd quirk to these side seats is that the one on the top left has the player's vision shot up several feet into the air. The other seats shoot the camera up here as well, but they fall back down to where the player's helmet would be, but this one stays stuck all the way up here. The second unused vehicle is the Wraith. It essentially has the same boosting ability that is seen in the final version, but that's where the similarities end. The targeting vehicle is the rocket launchers, which is funny because Halo 1's Wraith uses the same one. The most intriguing aspect of this Alpha Wraith, however, is the way it fires its mortars. It uses a brief charging sequence before discharging the plasma. The sound effect used for the brief charging sequence vaguely resembles the sound effects used for the Scarab's gun in the final game. This feature is actually still hidden in the final game's map files. With a bit of tweaking in the Wraith's mortar weapon tag, you can replicate how the Wraith was originally going to function in the earlier stages of development. Now we're going to go over each of the three playable maps in the Alpha and compare them to their later counterparts. First up, we'll go over Lockout. While the layer of the map is essentially identical to that of the final version, the way your Spartan moves in this build changes the way this map is played on a competitive level. As stated earlier, the Spartan's jump height is smaller in the Alpha, which means that the skill jumps that make this map so iconic to the veterans of Halo 2 are extremely difficult to pull off. The grad lift leading the top blue functions differently in the Alpha. In later builds of Halo 2, your character eases into the lift and is carried up at a moderate speed. In the Alpha, you're shot up immediately and your speed of ascent is much faster. This sometimes leads to players dying out of nowhere due to their models clipping into the wall behind them. The lift also uses the teleporter sound when a player steps into it. The gravity lift pad on the bottom floor is also visually incomplete, and in later builds of the game, it looks like an actual device is powering the lift instead of it just being randomly there. The green room in the Alpha is much darker and, in my opinion, a lot creepier in this build, whereas later on, the room brightens up and one of the doors is broken off. The skybox for the map is blurry and incomplete, and there's no snow effects being used on the level. In the beta, the skybox becomes much clearer, but it wouldn't be until the retail release of the game where the particle effects for snow are finally added to the map. Throughout Lockout, there are walkways and ramps that connect various parts of the map, such as the walkway from bottom blue to elbow, and the ramps connecting library to BR3. In the alpha, the ramps themselves are opaque, whereas in later builds they are converted to become transparent so players can see through them. The various fusion coils surrounding the map cannot explode no matter what you throw at them. A feature exclusive to the alpha version of Lockout are red lights that are shining on some of the various antennas on top of the map. For whatever reason, they were removed in the later versions of the map. 
In both the alpha and the beta, there are two ledges that a player can stand on underneath bottom glass. This was deemed too broken of a position, so in the final game, players will slide right off when they attempt to make contact with the surface. Lastly, there are various doors that are positioned above some of the holes leading to lower floors. In the alpha, these have no collision and the players can phase right through them, while in the beta and final game, this was rectified. Since the energy sword isn't included in this build of the game, a needler is in its spot for the time being. By proxy, the needlers that spawn in BR1 and BR2 aren't present in this build. On BR3, an SMG spawns where a battle rifle will eventually be placed. The magnum that eventually spawns in this spot in library doesn't show up yet. The plaza pistol still spawns in top mid, but in the final game it's moved slightly towards the edge of the platform. There's an interesting story about Lockout's sniper rifle throughout Halo 2's development. In the alpha, it spawns in S3, but in the beta, it was moved to S2 right in front of top mid, then in the final game, it moves back to S3 with a few fusion coils placed behind it. Lastly, we're going to come back to the library to discover a hidden rocket launcher perched on a small beam above this platform. This is exclusive to the alpha version of Lockout and was subsequently removed in later versions of the game. Our next map is Burial Mounds. Out of the three available maps in the alpha, this map has the least amount of drastic changes and is very close to what we'd have in the retail build, although there are a few differences here and there. This version of the map is noticeably more open, and this could be a problem for players that spawn on the attacker's side due to a lack of cover. To rectify this issue in the final game, rocks were placed in certain parts of the map to give extra leniency for offense. The skybox is pretty much the same one seen in the retail version, with the only noticeable difference being that burning debris does not appear in the alpha version. The last cosmetic change can be found with this specific piece of debris jutting out of the ground near the home base. While the overall shape and positioning of the wreckage goes unchanged later on, in the retail version of Burial Mounds, extra details in the form of a layer of burning and a noticeable crater underneath the pylon were added to insinuate that this piece of debris just recently fell from the destruction of Installation 04. On the attacker's side, there's a needler perched on a small plateau. It's moved onto the floor in the retail version. With the beam rifle not being implemented into this build just yet, a sniper rifle takes its place. Next to the entrance towards the rocket launcher bridge, a battle rifle rests where a needler will eventually sit in the retail version. In the back corner behind the Covenant generators, this SMG will eventually be replaced with a battle rifle. In between the generators rests a plaza pistol, which will become a shotgun in the final game. The side entrance to the base has another SMG, which becomes a plasma rifle later on. For whatever reason, in Slayer matches on this map, only one of the two turrets spawns where they should, whereas in CTF and Assault, both of them spawn. This was rectified in the retail version so that both turrets appear in Slayer. Due to a lack of carbines in the alpha, a battle rifle takes the carbine slot, and a shotgun sits where the energy sword will eventually spawn. An extra Warthog is parked next to the giant pylon, which is replaced with a ghost in the final game. The rocket launcher spawns closer to the defender's base in this build than it does in the final game, where it was moved to the opposite bridge closer to the attackers. Our last map is Waterworks, and out of all three maps, this level has undergone the most revisions from the alpha to retail. The bridges that each of the base's teleporters lead to have a major feature that's missing in the alpha, and it's the natural cliffside walkways that lead back to each team's respective base. Instead, the entrance is blocked off with a wall, leading to a dead end which forces the attackers to have to run out to the open. It only gets worse in this area because this specific area is also wide open, and the developers eventually added some extra rocks to the space to give the attackers some more cover. Another major feature are the rocky bridges that are connected from the central walkway leading to the middle of the map to the upper floors of the giant piston. What's interesting about both of these bridges is that while Red Team's bridge is elevated enough for the player to jump onto the platform to get to the sniper rifle, Blue Team's bridge is too low to allow a player to jump across, leaving Blue Team at a serious disadvantage when it comes to map control. This rocky bridge had gone through quite a few renditions throughout Halo 2's development. In the Halo 2 beta, both of the bridges became fused with the platforms so that both teams had a clear path to top mid. However, in the final game, the rocky bridges transformed again. Only this time, the base of the bridges became too steep for players to climb, and both teams no longer had the ability to reach top mid along this path. Yet another major difference is the lack of giant holes in the walls that are seen at each home base. In the beta and final game, these holes lead to another small hole in the floor that drops down to the first floor of the base, adding another safe way to get down there. This was most likely added to give some extra leniency to the defenders when going up against enemy snipers. 
On the ceiling, there are two holes that expose the skybox. In the alpha, these holes are a lot smaller than they are in the final game, and the skybox used is simply a white background. Now compare this to the later versions of the map, where one of the holes have dramatically increased in size and moved slightly to the right. And extra artistic details have been added to this part of the level, where the sunlight feeding into the cave adds a large layer of moss onto the rock wall next to the red base. Some of the rock walls in the alpha version of Waterworks are angled in a way so that players have the ability to actually walk on them. This was changed in later versions of the map, so that these walls would become too steep for players to climb them. Players can actually take the Banshee down the giant pit underneath the piston all the way to the ground floor and survive, although nothing besides rock walls meet you there. This can also be done in the beta, but it's much foggier down here. In the final version of the map, Bungie added a layer of water that kills players on contact to prevent anyone from surviving down there. None of the destructible stalactites that many players find to be iconic about this map are present in the alpha, and the stalactites that are on the map are static objects that cannot be destroyed. These were added into the beta version of the map. The giant piston in the center of the map is also not animated in the alpha. In later versions of the game, the piston will periodically slam downwards, causing the ground to shake if you stand near it. I like to point out how many sniper rifles there are on the map. One spawns on top of each base like they do in the final game, another two spawn in the middle platforms next to the piston, and finally one at each bridge near the teleporter receivers, specifically where the rocket launchers will be in the final game. This means that in the alpha version of Waterworks, there are a total of six sniper rifles on the map. The weapon featured as the central power weapon located in bottom mid changed a few times during development. In the alpha, it was a rocket launcher. In the beta, it was a brute shot. And now in the final game, it's an energy sword. At each respective base, the needler and the shotgun spawns are swapped in this build, with the shotgun spawning on the ramp leading to the second floor of the base itself, and the needler spawning in between the rocks directly outside the front of the building. Oddly enough, at blue base, the needler appears to spawn inside one of the rocks, but it can still be picked up regardless. There is one extra playable map, if you like to call it that, and it's the shared map. It's simply a small box map with no textures, and it houses a warthog and some of the weapons featured in the build. Nothing much to say here other than that this play space can offer some chaotic gameplay if you have enough people in the lobby. As previously mentioned, there are a total of 9 game types available in the Halo 2 Alpha. While game modes like Slayer, Juggernaut, and Oddball are self-explanatory and work as they do in the retail product, there are aspects relating to the other game types that require attention. One thing to mention before I start, if players attempt to play Juggernaut, King of the Hill, Race, and Territories online via System Link, the consoles that are not host will crash. They're safe to play locally, however. Capture the Flag essentially plays the same as it normally does, but the main difference here is that the flag itself is extremely goofy looking due to its placeholder status. Assault's fundamentals are intact in this build as well, but there are key differences to how this game mode is played out. When a player places the bomb into the enemy base, it immediately explodes and the team has earned a point. The interesting thing about this rendition of Assault is that it plays like a combination of one bomb assault and multi-bomb assault at the same time. What I mean by this is that once the bomb detonates, the round doesn't immediately end and the attacking team can make another attempt at arming the bomb. However, there is a short time limit akin to that of a one bomb assault game, and Jeff Steitzer will announce that each team will change sides once the time is up. Changing sides in 30. Once the timer reaches zero, a trippy scene of each team changing sides is played out, and the game resumes. Headhunter has the first half of the concept fully realized in this build, where the objective is to kill players to collect their skulls. However, the second part of the game type is missing. There's no way to actually complete the match due to a lack of hills to bring the skulls to, so the game just continues on forever until someone ends the session. Oddly enough, only the host of the match can see how many skulls a player is carrying, whereas everyone else is blind to that fact. Finally, King of the Hill is unplayable due to the hills spawning outside of the map boundaries. Race is also unplayable, but this time, no objectives spawn anywhere in the map geometry at all, and Territories has the same problem. There are other miscellaneous aspects of the Halo 2 Alpha that I feel are worth talking about. There's hidden pieces of content that can be found in the map files by swapping the projectiles of any weapon with whatever you want to spawn. Various types of ammo cases go unused in the Alpha's levels. The first one is the Needler's Blamite casing. This originally appeared in the 343 Guilty Spark mission in the first game, and while it didn't make it into the original Xbox release of Halo 2, it actually makes an appearance on Uplift, one of Halo 2 Vista's exclusive multiplayer maps. There's also the ammo boxes for the rocket launcher, shotgun, and sniper rifle as well. 
There's a couple of notable tidbits about the animations used for the Spartans. When a player is holding no weapons, the animations are very similar to those used for the weaponless chief in Halo 1. If a weaponless player enters the side seat of a warthog, they'll T-pose as there's no animation tied to the situation. Lastly, the player will also T-pose if they climb a ladder even if they're holding a weapon beforehand. This was one hell of a video to make and I'm super thankful to all those who have made this possible. I'd like to once again give a shout out to Toxin1 and his friends for getting this build functional and out there to the public. I'd also like to thank the Halo X-Link Kai community discord server in playing all of the matches we've played, especially those big team battle matches on waterworks and burial mounds. Most importantly, I'd like to thank each and every one of you lovely viewers for being patient with me and tolerating my faults. I want to start uploading more videos at a quicker pace, and I have a lot of video ideas ready to be worked on after this gargantuan project. This means more Lemmy Smash, more Halo memes, more beta analysis videos, more analytical videos in general, and a whole bunch of new content that I'm keeping under wraps for now. Anyways, that wraps up my full analysis of the Halo 2 Private Alpha. If, and only if, you like what you just watched, hit the like button and subscribe for more Halo content on this channel, and hit the bell icon to be notified when I upload a new video. This is the Ventual Vatum, and I'll see you on the great journey.